The fallout from Russia's invasion of Ukraine is hitting global supply chains, adding to the challenges faced by companies as they navigate the choppy waters brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. Analysts expect the trade disruptions to worsen as nations around the world distance themselves from Russia. The Biden administration and a number of US states have slapped sanctions on Moscow. But these punitive measures could have unintended consequences, as William Denslow finds out. With Ukraine under attack, this store in New York City's East Village is fighting to keep the country's cultural heritage alive. Arca has been a part of the little Ukraine neighborhood's social fabric for more than 70 years. This is the Ukrainian L, and this is the other letter. Yeah, Volya, which means freedom. freedom. Business has dwindled in recent years, but owner Nikola Drobenko says the local community has rallied behind them since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. A oh, shame that it had to be a war for people to wake up, you could say. You know, um, yes, um, um, people are more interested in the Ukrainian arts and crafts, not only Ukrainians, but Americans, all, all cultures. More than 150,000 Ukrainians live in New York City, making it the largest such population in the United States. In the aftermath of World War II, more than 60,000 Ukrainians lived here in Manhattan's East Village alone. Those figures have since declined, but the businesses that remain have seen a spike in support over recent weeks. Arca's owners say they're struggling to keep up with demand for some products. We're sewing uh, the flags because you probably could go on the internet, try to order, and then they're going to say out of stock or maybe in a month, maybe in a two. So that's the, the main, the major thing is everybody wants flags. And this is what we try to do. Certain specialty goods from Ukraine and the wider region could soon become harder to come by. The Biden administration has imposed strict sanctions on Moscow and a number of U.S. states, including New York, have followed suit. Governor Kathy Hochul has signed an executive order banning the state from trading with Russia. This part of Brooklyn's Brighton Beach is nicknamed Little Odessa, after the Ukrainian port city. It's home to a large Ukrainian population, but also a sizable Russian community, as well as other nations from across the region. Michael Levitis is a local radio show host in the Brighton Beach area. He says the community is diverse, yet united in solidarity with the Ukrainian people, but warns that sanctions could hurt businesses here. Right now, all business with Russia and Ukraine is dead. First of all, uh, there is the logistic, logistics uh, concern. Second of all, uh, people are afraid that Russian goods will be boycotted uh, in the US. Uh, also, a lot of people are dropping Russian goods as a show of solidarity for Ukraine. Some Russian stores in the area have taken down their signs, either out of concern of anti-Russian sentiment or in solidarity with Ukraine. Gold Label has been providing authentic produce from Russia and the broader region since the mid-90s. Its owners say they expect suppliers to begin running out of certain goods within months, forcing them to look for other vendors in Europe. But they say products, like some types of grains, will be difficult to source. It will likely add to price pressures that have already risen during the pandemic. Right now, it's probably, if you compare the prices from maybe a year ago, it's about 80% and we expect it to be about 150% at least. And then it's going to come to the break point when the people just simply don't want to buy. It's not just businesses that import Russian goods that will be impacted by sanctions. Firms that export goods there could also feel the pinch. In 2021, one of the biggest exports from the United States to Russia was uh, gas turbines. These are used in internal combustion engines of all sorts of kinds. So if you're a company in the United States that exports gas turbines to Russia, well, that's one of your major buyers is now gone. So I think that certain individual firms will see a tough time and they'll either have to find new buyers, which is not super likely, or they're going to be out a significant stream of revenue. <laughs> Direct trade between the US and Russia is relatively limited. Moscow is Washington's 26th biggest goods trading partner. 
In 2019, goods and services traded with Russia amounted to slightly less than $35 billion. But sanctions on Russia imposed by the US and its allies could also indirectly impact American firms. It creates a whole tumbling down the hill of issues that you don't think of. It sounds very good to say, well, I am just going to stop their goods and that's it. Well, how does that affect uh, you going to the store and buying food if, if wheat is, is rationed, things like that? So um, they may have a political point, uh, but that it is not without its effects on the consumers and effects on manufacturers. The Biden administration has banned Russian oil, and the average price of a gallon of gas in the US is the highest it's been in over a decade. Economists warn rising energy prices in Europe could impact trade with the US. Germany is reliant on Russian energy, and Berlin is Washington's top trading partner in Europe. Vehicles, pharmaceuticals and industrial machinery being among the major goods that Germany exports to the US. All the goods we get from Germany are going to end up being more expensive because it's going to be more expensive to ship them. We have to also consider that when the price of oil increases, airline companies, you know, the airline industry is going to get hit very hard because their costs are going to go up. These fresh trade concerns come as the world continues to battle supply chain disruptions fueled by COVID-19. The pandemic has sparked log jams at ports and labor shortages causing inflation in the US to surge to 40-year highs. We now have to separate out Ukraine and Russia from the general bubble that exists within the supply chain because this may in fact just add an additional bubble or a series of bubbles. So it, it's very difficult to say specifically how, you know, what that difference is. Some businesses in Brighton Beach may consider scrambling to alter their supply chains or simply try to weather the storm. A few importers of Russian goods in the US began sourcing products close to home back in 2014, following the annexation of Crimea. I know a lot of uh, Russian uh, grocery stores that were selling Russian um, goods, Russian food. They're really starting to manufacture and produce them here. On the Russian and Ukrainian recipes, but made in USA. Gold Label says it's seeing a spike in traffic as local residents stock up on their favorite goods. These products may soon become more expensive or harder to find as sanctions continue to bite. The crisis in Ukraine is worsening the crisis at sea, with longer shipping times expected and rising fuel costs. The combination of conflict and COVID-19 is also causing greater economic uncertainties for Malaysia's small and medium enterprises struggling to return to pre-pandemic levels. While China says it will boost production capacity and increase reserves to keep prices stable to ensure food and energy security. Energy and commodity prices have soared to decade-high levels as the war in Ukraine intensifies. China, the world's largest importer of oil and gas, is particularly vulnerable to price increases. China's top economic planner announced a hike of over $40 per tonne for the price of gasoline in the country. Uh, for China, it's really vulnerable to the global volatilities in the oil and natural gas market. Uh, although its domestic inflation pressure is not that high yet, uh, it will trickle down from the global market and reflect in China's stock and bond market. And that can be uh, quite a high pressure for how much room uh, the monetary easing can go within China. And the domestic inflation might be under threat of going up as well. But China's state planner has said it will boost production capacity, continue to invest in oil and gas exploration, strengthen reserves and guide coal prices within a reasonable range. It also pledged not to limit power and gas use during the winter months when heating demand goes up. China also said it will stabilize prices and output of domestic grain, corn and soybeans as food inflation risk balloons due to the Ukrainian crisis. 
Ukraine and Russia account for about a quarter of global trade in wheat and a fifth in corn sales. China has suffered from weak consumer demand since the pandemic hit, and keeping inflation low will be key to helping the economy recover. China has set a slower economic growth target of around 5.5 percent as global and domestic headwinds grow. Although the economy has reopened since October last year, many businesses are facing severe margin squeeze due to rising costs. The disruption in the global supply chain has led to a surge in logistics costs. It's gone up as much as eightfold or tenfold uh, over the past three months. That's, that's amazing, you know. Uh, uh, eightfold and tenfold is almost unheard of in a short span of, uh, of time. A quick check. Stocks are running out in some places. At Chili's, a leading family restaurant chain, there's no nachos for three months. While fast food chain McDonald's has stopped serving large fries. Many bubble tea houses have raised prices due to rising costs. Now, the chaotic global market due to ongoing crisis in Ukraine has further complicated business operations. Meanwhile, the Omicron wave in Malaysia is also not helping consumer sentiment, although it's said to be less dangerous than the Delta strain. The Omicron number has uh, surged tremendously. It's created a lot of fear in the market. People are still not coming out to, to dine. It's making the recovery a little bit difficult because of that. The other issue that we have is, of course, the uncertainty globally. Uh, right now, of course, you're looking at the, the, the crisis in Ukraine. So it's creating a lot of fear among the SMEs, especially the manufacturers, who are dependent on the US dollar uh, as a denomination. Uh, to decide you know, whether or not some orders should be taken in or not. The government has rolled out a series of initiatives worth some nine and a half billion US dollars to help businesses, including SMEs, such as alternative financing and loan guarantees. Some loans are interest-free and borrowers can delay payment for up to one year. But businesses hope that the government can help them contain the costs by holding off electricity tariff increase and delay implementing higher minimum wage till the recovery is on a firmer footing. You can put in as much uh, uh, liquidity into the market. It wouldn't it won't help because SMEs just do not want to continue their growth for the simple reason because of the low margin. Right? In fact, for some SMEs, the more you sell, the more you lose. So obviously the, the key challenge is how do we contain the cost? Without free movement, hope for a trade-based economic recovery will remain subdued as SMEs are competing with regional competitors in the global supply chains. Businesses in Vietnam are struggling to restore full operations due to the shortage of labour brought on by the pandemic. Late last year, there was a mass exodus of workers back to their hometowns after COVID-19 travel curbs were lifted. Many are not willing to return to the big cities to work. They fear getting stuck again under lockdowns if there is another fresh wave of infections. Tung Ngo finds out how some companies are adapting to the new labour and supply chain landscape. These two men have been hard at work to help others find a job, but they are struggling. Working out of a mobile recruiting unit in Vietnam's southern Binh Dương province, their task is to find 600 workers to fill their company's job openings. They have been actively searching for potential applicants to build sofas for two months now, but they only managed to fill half of the job vacancies. Tiễn đủ 600 ha, thì em nghĩ là không bao giờ đủ. Tại con mới vô lại mới lại ra, nhưng công ty em thì thấy là giống như phụ cấp nhà ở này nọ cho công nhân mới. Cái số lượng bây giờ tuyển công nhân mai là rất là hiếm. Giống như cái xưởng em là ba xưởng, một xưởng mai và hai xưởng kia nó thành phẩm, mà bên em thì không có đủ công nhân mai thì hai xưởng kia nó sẽ bị hụt hàng. Across Vietnam's manufacturing hubs in southern provinces, domestic and foreign companies are facing a serious labor shortage. Last year, around 1.3 million migrant workers left Ho Chi Minh City and surrounding provinces as the country eased its travel and movement restrictions. As Vietnam moves toward living with COVID-19 as endemic, companies are resuming their operations. But not all of the workers are coming back. And factories are struggling to fill their head counts. 
two main reasons is COVID being really still uh, around. There are 200 plus thousand cases per day. The second aspect is cost of living. Over the last two months, we had the price of gasoline increase 30%. Food is increasing. So we have a conjunction of price increase on the basics of living, which actually doesn't really incentivize workers to, to, to come back. And, and even though the salaries are, are higher. This is a common sight. Job advertisements on display outside almost every factory here in Binzhuang. Most of the job offered here come with a monthly income of around 450 US dollars. Nguyễn Thị Hằng was working at a shoe factory in Bình Dương for two years when the worst COVID-19 outbreaks hit Vietnam last year. For three months, she stayed at a cramped rented house with no freedom of movement due to COVID-19 lockdowns and with no income. Ở trong nhà thôi đâu có làm được gì đâu anh. Nói chung là nhiều khi lương thực cũng không có mà ăn luôn. Cảm giác giống như kiểu mà nó gò bó lắm ở trong trọ thì anh nói bốn đến bức tường thôi đâu có ra được đâu. As soon as the lockdown ended, Miss Hang embraced her freedom and returned to her home village in Central Hà Tĩnh province. But unlike many who have chosen not to return to big cities to find a job, Hang decides to return to Bình Dương. hầu như tuổi nếu mà tuổi như em thì người ta sẽ lên hết. còn nhiều người mà có gia đình thì người ta sẽ về. Nhà em thì có công ty may thôi nhưng mà lương thấp lắm. Dạ. Lương thì à, lương cơ bản là 4 triệu mấy thôi à. A shortage of labor is adding to the woes of labor intensive businesses in Vietnam that are already struggling due to lockdowns. Right now the biggest challenge is uh, uh, lack, lack of the worker, number of workers and lack of the orders from cust our customer. And, it doesn't mean that combined together. In case of textile area, especially, uh, need a lot of number of workers. But in this case, very serious. We will face the, a lot of difficulties with that. No workers, no work. This company hires some 4,000 workers to make clothes for many brands around the world, from Walmart, Target, and Gap, to Uniqlo, Zara, and H&M. During the peak of COVID-19 outbreaks in Vietnam last year, the plan was forced to shut down for one month. The company also conducted partial operation for three months, with reduced number of workers staying and sleeping on factory grounds as part of compliance with COVID-19 rules in Vietnam. The company said it suffered around 10 million US dollars in losses during that period. Number of workers, uh, we, we, we've lost uh, almost 10% per, per year, every year. Listen to, so listen to three, <clears throat> three years, since three years, almost 30%, 34%. But industry insiders say why shortage of workers for some specific industries would take time to address. The manpower shortage might be temporary. So far, the manufacturing activities um, have uh, rebounded strongly. Since the country is shifting away, you know, from aggressive COVID-19, uh, you know, containment uh, strategies to boost its economy, um, you know, which has been aided by more than 90% of our uh, adult uh, population be being fully vaccinated. Um, we expect the, the staffing setback will show signs of easing by the end of second quarter. But the again. lack of workers yeah. is not the only obstacle to the resumption of manufacturing activities in Vietnam. Many costs of, for example, energy, electricity uh, costs, and also gasoline, and also logistic problem, hmm? a lot of jam, to, to send the USA for ex exportation, all cost up. That's our uh, challenge. As part of a company that operates 40 factories in 10 countries around the world, this plant is impacted by the global supply chain disruption. Like many factories in Vietnam, the manufacturers is adapting to a new supply chain landscape and that created opportunities for many players, 
especially those in land and warehouse rental businesses. Before COVID, we talk, we talk, we were talking about just in-time model, you know, where you know, we, the companies uh, were trying to minimize the cost. Before they may need only like two or three month inventory, but now they may need to to stock up maybe up to nine or even twelve month inventory, in order to kind of you know to ensure their production stability. You know that that change in the mentality and the, the way they work actually increased the demand for warehouse. Land prices in Vietnam for industrial plants in some areas have increased between 50 and 100 percent over the last two years. Land availability in many provinces is another issue. And that forces developers and manufacturers to take bolder steps toward adopting smarter factories and manufacturing automation together with cleaner energy. Observers say Vietnam is poised to emerge strongly despite setbacks from the pandemic in the last two years. With an open economy and more than a dozen free trade agreements, Vietnam has excelled in reeling in the big fish in electronics, footwear and clothing in recent decades. But challenges remain for existing investors. Industry insiders say some companies have temporarily moved some of its manufacturing activities outside of Vietnam to avoid increasing logistics costs. While these challenges would take time to address, many called on Vietnam to speed up reforms and make it easier for corporations to conduct business in Vietnam. The most important is it needs to meet our standard, at least uh, in terms of transparency and in terms of uh, ease of doing business. So Vietnam has to prepare a lot in terms of infrastructure, both hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure. For the soft uh, infrastructure, we are talking about human resources, which is still a weak point in Vietnam. But many are optimistic on Vietnam's economic recovery and its growth potential in the next few years. The confidence is back and European company leaders here are having an optimistic outlook in the economy of Vietnam and also their, their business result over the next quarter. Why Vietnam is working towards moving the country to the cost of living with COVID-19 and treating it as endemic, even as infection cases surge. Vietnam Prime Minister Phạm Minh Chính says the upcoming months will continue to be difficult and unpredictable.